Well, happy Friday, everybody. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over two decades of experience as a painter, a craftsman, a restorationist, a colorist, uh, and an enthusiasm for the painting trade and business uh, side of it to answer any of your questions, whether you're a pro or whether you're a homeowner. Uh, Ask a Painter was started almost a year ago uh, to fulfill a need that I saw to help out homeowners uh, from a pro's angle uh, to ease their uh, yeah, projects, uh, help them out with materials, uh, uh, tools, processes, things like that. Uh, we've now partnered with the PDCA, the Painting and Decorating Contractors of America, uh, to bring you the pro side of that. The PDCA is the group of the finest craftspeople uh, in the United States and for that part Canada, South America and the world. Uh, and they all come together, all business owners, all entrepreneurs and, and practitioners of their trade. And uh, so now we have the pro angle coming in and we have the homeowner angle coming in. And it's, uh, it's a nice marrying of the two so we can help each other out. We can, pros, you can see what the homeowners are thinking, what they want to know about. Uh, sometimes we get so myopic in our, in our business decisions that, you know, uh, sometimes we forget that we're doing this all for the customer. Um, and then uh, homeowners, you can also see the insights of a pros. What are we thinking about, you know? I think homeowners would be very surprised uh, as to how much time, how much thought, and how much care we actually take with the simple act of painting a home. So today uh, is everything you've ever wanted to know about decks. I'm going to get into a bunch of questions that I've collected over this last week, a bunch from homeowners, a bunch from pros. Uh, we'll have the contractor question of the week uh, from the PDCA, uh, and we'll get into all that here. I have a lot of things to show you guys. Uh, we are at my house. Uh, my house's 100th birthday was this year. Uh, a week ago, we finished the restoration, uh, including me experimenting with a whole bunch of chemistry on this deck to fine tune my, my stripping, finishing, brightening process uh, in preparation for this presentation. Uh, and then doing some research behind that. And I will present all that to you guys today. So bear with me. This is probably going to be a longer one, but everything you've ever wanted to know about decks practically. There's 5% of stuff that you, I've left out that you probably don't need to know about that only once every three or four years a pro is going to run into. But uh, for this part, almost every outdoor deck, pergola, uh, play set, uh, swing set, uh, outdoor structure you're going to find made out of pine or cedar uh, will be correctly treated with 99% of the things I tell you here. So, first of all, I want to say a big thank you to uh, InPaint Magazine this week, and I apologize this will all be reverse uh, because of the camera. But uh, in paint, they had a great section on exterior paint selection. Uh, I'm in here with a bunch of other pros. You can read my little section on the back here about uh, my particular exterior paint that I like. Uh, there's a lot of good ones, but I picked out a, a particular favorite of mine. Uh, another pro that all you guys will be uh, familiar with here is uh, Christian Militello, uh, a guy who uh, I picked the brain of to uh, hone this presentation on deck washing. Uh, deck stripping, uh, deck brightening, things like that. He's a professional washer along with, uh, alongside of being a professional painter. And uh, he really, he's in depth of this stuff. Uh, uh, I, got a, I got a great contribution from Nick Lagrasso as well, a, a fellow painting, uh, painting contractor down from there, Missouri. So thank you for InPaint for including uh, of the pro's perspective in here. And also uh, APC Magazine. Uh, I was honored with a huge box uh, for the Top Job Award for 2017. This thing has, uh, they took out the uh, the picture of the project here, framed it for me, sent it. They also sent a whole bunch of really thick truck magnets like that. Uh, we got t-shirts, we got pens, uh, we got a whole bunch of other promotional materials, a whole stack of those magazines. Uh, unexpected, but very, very nice. And I'm going to share all that with the crew today. So uh, very, very happy about that. That was a huge honor. Uh, the award is a great thing. Uh, but it's even greater when you when you look at the people who are alongside you who are restoring churches, doing you know a twelve million dollar residential projects, things like that. And it's very humbling uh, to be included with that, or at least even be considered for something like that. So quite an honor. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, we'll get to our uh, PDCA Painting and Decorating Contractors of America uh, question of the week. Uh, this comes from Calvin Pate, who I had the uh, distinct honor of meeting and spending some time with at this last expo. Uh, truly admirable individual. Uh, he runs a great outfit. Uh, they do a lot of property maintenance, uh, run and gun, uh, lots of guys, lots of paint. It's very impressive to get that angle. It's very much different than what I do, but uh, so impressive uh, to get the other perspective from the industry. But he, uh, he writes in, have you ever used Sherwin-Williams snap dry? If so, uh, do you find that it requires additional prep to get proper adhesion? 
He's trying his best to get a, uh, a Ask a Painter coffee mug. So, and Calvin, I will send you one of those, no problem. Thank you so much for the question, and uh, thank you for uh, for all your input uh, when I met you at the uh, at the Expo this last time. You've given me a great perspective on the trade, where I stand in it, and, uh, and what to look forward to in the future. And a lot of the changes that I've made in my own business were from uh, conversations uh, with you and, and, and some other very, very important people to me now. So um, thank you for that. Uh, snap dry. Used it on two occasions. Uh, purposefully, I used it on a uh, pre-finished metal door frame because I feel that's what most people are going to be using it for. And I have a feeling, Calvin, that your company will probably be doing that if you're doing uh, you know, multifamily, if you're doing uh, hotels, uh, apartments, things like that. You probably want to, uh, to get that enamel on there as quick as you can so it's dry, so the doors can be shut, things like that. Uh, I've also used it uh, on, a, on a almost perfect uh, situation for that type of paint. It was a home where uh, the door frame was replaced uh, on the entry door, and it was about 45 minutes away from my house, and I had to go up there, and this is a great customer of mine. I just had to quick seal it all up, prime it, paint it, and, uh, you know, as quickly as I can. And if I used a standard, you know, oil primer and either oil uh, top coat or a hybrid top coat, it could be a multi-day project. And snap dry was a perfect, uh, uh, a perfect process for that. I used some quick dry uh, water-based primer, uh, followed the specs on that, sanded it. Uh, you know, I had all the holes filled, I had everything caulked, and then following the guidelines of snap dry, I put on two quick coats of that, sanding in between coats, and you know, within about a half a day of doing some other miscellaneous things for, for her on her job site. Uh, it, it, it worked out perfect, and it's a great hard finish. When I left, I didn't feel like I was leaving her. You know, she has a whole bunch of labs uh, running around the house. I didn't feel like there was going to be a bunch of fur stuck to it. I didn't have any problem uh, removing tape, sanding between coats. It, it dried very, very quickly. I did find, uh, what you're probably finding with snap dry, Calvin, is that on some of these pre-finished pre metal door frames or even pre-primed metal door frames, like in commercial settings, there can be a little bit of adhesion problems. And I think this is a very common sort of uh, trait of these quick dry, you know, water-based primers, or excuse me, water-based enamels. And it, technically it's sort of a, you know, a paint, but a lot of people are going to be using it, a standard paint, but most people are going to be using it for uh, that particular reason. It, it's got a nice, it's got a harder finish than you would normally find in, uh, in a regular wall paint, uh, but one of the trade-offs is less adhesion. Um, a couple things you can do to, uh, to prevent this. Number one, you can either make it up in priming or you can make it up in prep or both, but if you're doing, you know, uh, the last setting that I did was a, a, a municipality, a school building here, and we had 478 door frames to do. And uh, I spent about two or three hours experimenting with some different products because obviously you know, that's cheap insurance when you're going through an entire commercial building like that. Uh, and I've actually found that uh, you know those products like that, they did fairly well. The coverage wasn't as good as a lot of other products you may have used. I was using a deep red over a deep red, and still even the coverage was a little bit spotty. Um, it doesn't have as good as adhesion of the other stuff. And like I said, you can either prime or you can either make up for it in, uh, in prep. But if you have that many door frames to do, and, and Calvin, I assume some of your projects have thousands and thousands of them, uh, it's a huge thing to have to go back and either sand or prep or, or vacuum and tack rag all these off. Um, if you're lucky enough to have the stuff stick right away, it's a great product. If you have to do something, if you have to amend the current finish, I found that just switching to a different product. Uh, for that school, I actually ended up using uh, Benjamin Moore Aura Interior Satin. Um, after, after scratch tests, after tape tests, uh, coverage tests, all that stuff, it, it outperformed some of the other sort of quick dry enamels on the market and uh, it's got such a smooth finish too. So a little more expensive, not that much though. I mean, now paints are all expensive. So, you know, anywhere between that 40 and 60 bucks a gallon, you know, it's cheap insurance if you don't have to go over and, and reprime or reprep. If it saves you one process on 500 door frames, you know, 50 bucks a gallon is not a big deal. So uh, I'm sure that's what you found. And Calvin, if you've had another experience with it, uh, please let me know, especially in a large sort of production setting. I'd love to know how, how you guys, how, uh, excuse me, how you guys have used it and things like that. So, okay, we're going to talk about decks. I'm going to go through uh, the information I prepared for you guys, and then I'll go through, I've collected a whole bunch of questions from homeowners and pros. So, um, why finish a deck? For, we should always be questioning why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, you can make the argument that you're uh, finishing a deck to make it look better or to make it last longer. Uh, the last longer argument, maybe not as good as the uh, statics argument. Most people, 
I get the feeling probably well over 90 95% of the people that I work for, when they have me do a deck, it's because they want it to look different or look better or, or something along the lines of aesthetics. Not many people are worried about their deck rotting, and, and probably rightfully so, because this deck here, this is my deck, this is Cedar, if I did nothing eight or ten years ago when I put this thing on, it would not be rotting off my house. In fact, it'd probably be in about the same condition it is now. It would just look different. It would be gray. Cedar, oak, uh, pine. Pine gets a little white, but almost everything else grays out. Um, if you don't mind the look of gray, that is a maintenance-free deck. That is as maintenance-free, even more so than some of the Trex or composite deckings that you get out there, because over the span of, their, uh, of, of a composite decking's life, it drastically changes. Uh, it loses the shine, it loses the texture, and it turns into sort of a, a, uh, a sponge for powdery mildew and other stuff like that. So, number one, always keep the perspective that a untreated cedar deck, basically maintenance-free if you keep uh, the majority of the sun off it and the majority of the rain off it. Now, because it's a deck, that doesn't happen. But, like my, my deck on the north side of the house, uh, and it's got a, plenty of uh, tree coverage and stuff, it doesn't get blasted with that south sun. Uh, and it doesn't come into a contact with a lot of moisture. We have gutters on top that drain all the water away. <coughs> Once in a while it gets wet, but, but uh, you know, I, the only reason I stain my deck is because I want it to look like natural mahogany. And I like that color. You know, you can see my natural mahogany screen door. This mimics this pretty well. It's just aesthetics, yes. It will extend the life of the deck, but always remember that a, a pressure-treated pine or a natural cedar deck, as long as you don't mind whitish, grayish looking stuff, maintenance free. So always keep that in mind with your homeowners like there. People feel that it, you should put your homeowners at ease and homeowners be at ease that if you don't stain your deck, the life will be shortened, but not by that much, maybe 10%, give or take, as long as you don't have any systematic water draining or, or things like that. So um, of these decks, okay, now why finish a deck? Uh, it's for aesthetics or for to extend its life? Basically, there's only two types of decks that I do up here, uh, and there's only three treatments that I do to them. I try to streamline it. Again, 95% of all my customers uh, have those types of decks, two types of decks, and I only do three types of treatments to them. That covers almost everything, unless somebody has something so out of the ordinary. Uh, two types of decks, we have cedar, we have pressure-treated pine. Now, again, we have the ipe, we have mahogany, we have uh, Brazilian cherry, we have uh, tiger wood, we have all that stuff. Maybe 5% of the decks I do. I do a couple of those every year. I maintain a couple uh, lake homes and stuff that have them. Uh, I can talk about that stuff later, but honestly, it, it doesn't come up that often. And those woods, again, if you do nothing, just kind of go silvery gray and they last forever. Uh, you can treat them uh, it, it, to preserve the looks, but that's a, that's a whole other deal. So, uh, two types of decks, three basic types of treatments. The treatments are a translucent finish, which you sort of see here. This is, a, this is on the heavier side of the pigmented translucent. You have a cedar or a natural look. You have what I would term semi-solids not really semi-transparent, maybe a step up from semi-transparent, semi-solids, and then you have the solid color, which is basically just a painted look. So on cedar decks, on pressure-treated pine decks, those three processes will take care of 95% of all my customers, maybe even more. Uh, color. Color is a big thing. I usually, uh, before talking about the condition of the deck and everything else, when, when a customer calls me up and asks for a deck estimate, what do you want it to look like? And, you know, luckily, you know, when you look in the backyards of a lot of these places, there's a whole bunch of examples you can look at. And normally they'll say, well, I want it to look like that person's deck. And then you basically have to figure out what do they have here and how can I get it there. Um, because you're dealing with translucent finishes, you're always dealing with the condition of the wood underneath and whatever previously uh, applied finishes are on there as well. So if somebody has a deck that somebody put some semi-solid or some solid color stain on there or some correct deck or redeck or all those rubberized texture coatings on there and they say, I want it to go back to this, this natural cedar like this, you're going to be in for some work. Every bit of that stuff has to be chemically and mechanically stripped off like that. Now, if somebody has a deck like mine and, wanted, and wants to redo that, easy as pie. If somebody has a deck like mine and wants it to be dark brown, uh, barn red, uh, you know, more, more opacity in the finish, that's easy too. You can always go darker. Anytime you go lighter, uh, within reason, it takes much, much more work. And, and how far it is, how, how far that gap is between what they want and what it is, uh, can depend on the chemical and mechanical processes you use and how much effort goes into it. So, and we will get into that stuff later. Uh, so color is a big thing. 
in, in my three types of finishes, you have the cedar, the natural look, which this is. This is sort of a natural uh, here with a little bit of pigment in it. The semi-solids can be any color of the rainbow. It's, it's basically, if in theory, this is, not a, 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 this is not what it is. It's not a half thin down solid stuff. It's a translucent with pigment bumped up in it. Um, so if you think about that, it's, it's a probably halfway between a translucent and a solid, but it is not just a thinned down version of it. It's a specially made product. A little more opacity in it, hides a lot of blemishes. If somebody has a deck that has a bunch of old finishes on there uh, and they don't mind going a little deeper, a bark malt color, an oak color, a, a reddish color, a redwood color, something like that, that will hide a lot of sins like that if they want to do minimal prep. Uh, and then with solid color, you can go whatever you want. A lot of the times, solid colors don't vary much from white, off-white, maybe some grays here or there. Uh, a very, uh, one of the only times I use the solids anymore, uh, I, I usually try to counsel people out of it unless it's already done that way. But you know, when somebody has the white spindles and then the natural floor, the white spindles and the oak brown floor, something like that, so a combination of them. So, okay, uh, prep. Prep is, again, <laughs> same thing with restorations, painting, everything else. The longer I'm in this, the more I realize that we're basically, we should be called preppers, not painters. Uh, the painting is an afterthought. The painting is, you know, almost uh, the easy part. When we get to the painting part of an interior or exterior project, it all, it's almost a sigh of relief because all the difficult and all the tedious things have been done. Decks are no different. There is no exterior structure, at least in my neck of the woods, that gets more damage, uh, more water damage, more UV damage, more wear and tear. I mean, there's furniture on this stuff. Uh, this thing, it, right under here is a hot tub. We got chemicals from the hot tub. We got kids jumping out. Uh, we got a pathway here. This thing collects snow all winter. They try to shovel off. Uh, it's got the furniture, metal furniture, uh, leaving rust on there. We have dinner out here. There's food. It's, you cannot get a structure outside that takes uh, more wear and tear than a deck. So when we go into prep, understand that just like anything else, it's going to take a ton of prep. Uh, there is an old wives tale about prep. Let's say somebody puts on a brand new cedar deck and they say, well, you can either let it weather for a year or you can go through the washing and the sanding and the cleaning process. And either one of those systems, waiting a year or that prep process, will get you to a point where it will accept stain. Uh, that is an incorrect kind of old-fashioned way of looking at it. Um, in six months, if you do nothing to a deck, uh, there's a, a chemical in the wood called lignin, which is actually the glue that holds all the fibers together, the, the, the fibrous materials. If you leave a deck go for six months, 50% of that lignin is gone. So all those fibers are basically just laying there, uh, turn gray, turn white, and have lost 50% of their ability uh, to have uh, anything adhere to them at all. So they're basically just kind of loose, ready to, ready to come off. Um, if you look at uh, forestry products websites, if you look at every single outdoor stain, uh, semi-clear, clear, clear uh, product you can buy in the market, they will all say almost exactly the same thing. In order for this stain, uh, to, to you know, work at its best, you're going to need to wash it and sand it, or some combination of both. Uh, if you just leave it sit, you still have to do this stuff. So some people, you know, I shouldn't say some people, almost all the people I work for, they, they, when they call about a new deck, they, they said, hey, we've let it sit for six months, we've let it sit for a year, um, so we don't have to wash it, we don't have to sand it, you can just come on over and stain it. Well, they have let their deck go gray. They have not used it for six months or a year trying to be nice to it. And now I still have to go and prep it. I have seen the same amount of quality as sometimes even better when a deck is brand new, shiny cedar. When I come and do a washing process and a sanding process and a cleaning process, I get a better result than when we wait a year and then you have a whole bunch of dead wood fiber on the deck. You have to get rid of that dead wood fiber and you still wash it, chemically treat it and sand it. So uh, counsel your homeowners, homeowners take note that it doesn't matter if you wait a day or, or a year, you still have to go through the same prep process. So you might as well do it right away uh, within reason uh, and then enjoy your deck. Uh, timing of the year, especially in my neck of the woods when we only have six months outside and six months inside, uh, can be a factor as well. But Generally, all these companies suggest the same thing. You get a little bit of TSP, you get a little bit of bleach, and you mix it with some water, and you apply it to the deck. Uh, TSP will, uh, will break down a bunch of dirt, get rid of that. Uh, it will actually form into a soap uh, when combined with uh, dirts and, and different chemicals on the deck, and the bleach will kill any mildew. It'll also help with a tiny bit of, uh, of the lightening the wood. It'll at least loosen those old wood fibers, so it may not chemically change the color of the wood, like other products I'll go through later, but it will uh, 
loosen and remove and aid in the removal of those dead wood fibers. So it's basically, I think it's about four ounces of uh, liquid TSP or powder TSP. I would recommend the liquid, it, it blends up easier. A uh, quart of bleach and then three quarts of water. And that's a general mixture. I would probably do about two or three batches of those. That'll get the average deck, you know, something like this, like a 12 by 24, uh, give or take. So apply it to the deck. Obviously, it's best to do it on a cool day, day where there's not a lot of wind, not in direct sun, so it doesn't dry out right away. You just keep it wet, apply it, 10 to 15 minutes of dwell, and then you wash it off, scrub it off, do whatever you have to from there. Um, the thing you're trying to get rid of uh, initially with these new decks is mill glaze. Um, there, there is also, <laughs> uh, nowadays, uh, they have gone away from treating uh, uh, pine and other woods, uh, pressure treated woods with arsenic and other harmful chemicals. And a lot of times what you find is that they've replaced them with a wax substance now. So now, not only are we dealing with mill glaze, which is actually when you run a piece of wood through the woodworking uh, tools that actually make it into the form of a deck board, uh, when the knives rotate fast enough, they actually burnish the wood and make it shiny. So if you ever go look at a deck board uh, and hold it up to the light, you'll actually see the shine and you can actually see some you know, things from the knives and things like that that will prevent uh, stain and other uh, coatings from, from penetrating in there. So this washing will open that up, get rid of some of the dead fibers, scrubbing it and stuff like that. And especially when we have like the new pressure treated pine, there may be a waxy substance that they pressure treated with. And that substance, um, uh, especially the TSP, will, will bond with that waxy substance, turn it into a soap, and you can wash it right off. It kind of uh, encapsulates it and emulsifies and then gets it out of there for you. Uh, if you have a deck, that is a disaster. It's been 10 years, it's been coated with three different things, nobody's done any prep, it's, it's dark, there's some coating on there, things like that. There's two things you can do to it. You can try chemically brightening it with oxalic acid, and this comes in many forms. There's off the shelf, you know, you can buy jugs of uh, pre-made stuff like this or, or concentrate. Uh, you can mix up your own. Uh, this is a sack of oxalic acid. Uh, this reacts with the tannin in the wood, either with oak or with cedar, uh, mahogany, other things like that. It chemically changes the color of whatever wood it comes in contact with. So my first attempt always is uh, if a deck's got a very old brittle finish on it, I first mix up some deck brightener, either the pre-mixed form, which you can, I'll show you, I have the pressure washer set up here too, I'll show you how I apply all that chemical and stuff like that. Um, but you can, you can either use the pre-mixed, mix up some of your own. I try test patch, and a lot of the times, you'll be surprised, uh, uh, if you mix the right consistency, a lot of times it will remove a lot of that old brittle finish. You don't have to technically use a stripper all the time. Uh, if you find that a lot of the stuff is not coming off the deck and the homeowner wants it all the way down to bare wood, you've got to go through the stripping process. Do not undergo this process lightly. It is a time consume. It, the cost of the chemicals is not that much. It's easy to apply. It's the act of being thorough, getting 100% of the coating off the deck. It takes a ton of time, and you have to apply it right. The conditions, the climate will help or hurt you depending on how hot it is, how windy it is. Uh, if it's, uh, you know, if, if it's cool outside, overcast, no wind, the deck will stay wet a long time. If it's 86 degrees, windy and sunny, you're gonna have a very hard time keeping that stripper wet. If, it, if the stripper dries out, it's not gonna be effective. So. Always try to brighten the deck first. Sometimes the power of that uh, chemical, the oxalic acid, or the equivalents that come in the, in the pre-mix stuff, uh, will actually loosen a lot of that old brittle finish. If it doesn't, and, and I, I get very specific, anytime I, I even think that there might be a possibility of completely stripping a deck, I walk the homeowner through the whole process. So you can't say, oh yeah, here's, here's what it costs to stain your deck. I'll figure out how to get it there. There is a huge difference between spraying on some chemical brightener and washing it off. It only adds about 10 or 15 minutes to the entire process of washing a deck. Uh, and that does huge things. But if you're going to strip it, it could be a half day, uh, two thirds of a day to thoroughly, thoroughly go through the underside of every board, every nook, every cranny, the sides of the floorboards. It is a huge thing where it would take me, you know, my deck is all low to the ground here and it's got a finish that's maintained well. It takes me a half an hour to wash my deck. It's basically just getting dirt off. If you have one that's two stories up, it's got, uh, you know, two or three kink stairwells and they're gonna strip that thing, that could be a multi-day project. Huge difference between two hours of washing versus two days of stripping it down and neutralizing and all that other stuff. So, we have our general wash, uh, you know, the, the TSP, the bleach and the water for the new decks. Um, we have chemically brightening uh, with oxalic acid and we have stripping. 
uh, sodium hydroxide is basically, now I, I wade into this territory uh, as a generalist. Uh, I, I am basically a residential repainting contractor. I do commercial, I do industrial, I do churches, I do agricultural buildings, decorative finishing, wallpaper, all that other stuff. I enjoy this stuff, that's why I keep myself up on it. I am by no means the authority on what they call soft washing. Uh, I don't wash vinyl sided houses, I don't wash windows, I don't do any sort of concrete washing unless my homeowners just ask me to quick hit a sidewalk or something. Uh, that is a whole nother field of this. It, it's almost a separate thing now. It's like, uh, you know, uh, removing popcorn ceiling. That has gone the way of drywallers taking care of that now. I don't even mess with that. That's I diversify myself, but only to a point. Uh, I have one pressure washer that I bought seven or eight years ago. I did my research then. Uh, I did my research on chemicals. 95% of, of all, well, I shouldn't even say 95%. It's been 10 years. Uh, I have basically not found a deck with, with these couple chemicals and that one machine that I haven't been able to prep to a high degree of efficiency, uh, of quality. So basically, yes, there are other ways to do this. There are other chemicals to do this. Uh, there are trailers you can drag behind your truck with 12 volt systems. Uh, we got all sorts of different chemicals, all sorts of chemistry. You can buy stuff from companies, you can make it yourself. I'm just using readily available products, things that a lot of homeowners and pros can get at home stores uh, to do professional work here uh, and, and maybe pushing it a little bit with the homemade chemicals here, but I'm basically telling you that in, in 10 years I have not found a residential wood structure that I cannot prep to a high, uh, high degree of quality with what I'm talking here. So, um, and there are some pros out there who, who solely just do uh, wood restoration and all that other stuff. And uh, certainly chime in if you have some uh, recommendations here. Uh, but basically, if you strip a deck, uh, usually it's a very basic, um, it's a very basic substance. And, and by basic, I mean alkaline on the pH scale. Uh, alkaline will remove a lot of the oil-based finishes here. Uh, what you have to do uh, is then neutralize it, and that's simply with oxalic acid with the right mixture. Your your deck brightener mixture will then bring that back. Uh, I always use a, a combination of agitation, pressure washing, depending on the deck. Uh, if a deck is very old, sometimes it's, it's better to have a deck that's very old and neglected or a deck that's perfectly new and maintained. It's those middle decks that are sort of some areas are bad, but some areas have good finish. Those are the toughest ones to do. If a deck is old and all the finishes are brittle and stuff like that, everything comes off easy. You don't even need chemicals a lot of the time. You just give it a, give it a scrub, give it a wash, sometimes even just a wash, and it goes right back to normal. Do a little sanding, do a little blowing off of the leaf blower, and then you stain it. And new decks, very easy to do. A lot of times you're just washing dirt off. It's that middle ground, the, the neglected decks that are dirty, that are old, but still have a bunch of finish on, where you may have to uh, mess with the stripper. So, pressure washer, agitation. Uh, there's people who do it soft washing without the pressure uh, of a pressure washer behind it too. That's fine. Homeowners, you're probably not going to uh, find that that's useful for you. Uh, there are some tests to figure out that uh, once you've either stripped, once you've either brightened, whether it's time to stain your deck or even if you're able to, uh, the simple one without any tools or special knowledge or anything is the water drop test. Um, after you've given your deck at least 24 hours to dry, no heavy dew, no rain, things like that, you can take a couple drops of water and set it down on the floorboards or the handrail. And uh, if it soaks in, uh, it's ready. It, it's accepting of stain. Now, I've read six manufacturers' recommendations on this process. I've talked to all of my paint reps uh, as far as this goes. There is a span of time in which this drop, uh, if it soaks in, it's acceptable or not. Uh, about half the people I said, it must soak in immediately. You should drop it and it should immediately start migrating into the wood. Uh, about the other half said anywhere between 30 seconds and two minutes. Two minutes seems like a, uh, on the far end of it. I think anywhere between that immediate and 30 second time, if you can get your drop to completely soak into the deck, then I think you're in, you're in pretty good shape. And this is obviously gonna uh, change depending on the type of wood, condition of it, how old it is, if there's cracks in it, things like that. That's the simple low tech test. Uh, there's another way, uh, if you're a professional and a craftsperson, this is what you use. This is a moisture meter. Uh, this basically is a two prong thing here, nine volt battery. One button, you plug this in. I'm gonna punch this into the side of my hot tub here. 8%. So, hot tub is plenty ready to go. I'll walk over here and uh, see if we can get a good shot of 12% on that. So, uh, manufacturers 
and what I found to be a, a good range, um, 7 to 15. Uh, uh, most man I've seen some manufacturers recommend as high as 18%. Obviously, if you can get it on the lower scale, it's good. You're not going to find wood having much less than 7 to 10% moisture. There's a natural equilibrium in the atmosphere of barometric pressure and humidity where wood is just going to have a natural amount of moisture in it. So. Uh, and woodworkers, uh, people who make furniture will know that too, that you think, well, I'm going to get this wood to 0% moisture. It, it's basically not possible. If you do that, it gets so brittle and so dry, you actually deteriorate the wood. So there seems to be a natural stasis. You know, maybe 7 to 10% is a good one. Um, I've had success, 15 to 18%, you know, just as a rec uh, manufacturer's recommendation state. Uh, they've all been very good. Uh, so, oh, we got, uh, your mic is too low. Oh, let me hear this guy up. You guys let me know how the sound is here. We're, exper er, excuse me, we're experimenting with some Bluetooth wireless mics here. So uh, if it's not loud enough, please let me know. Uh, I've, I've done, uh, and what you'll find is sometimes even on, on houses or sheds, you go on different sides. Uh, you go on the south side and the moisture will be, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10 percent. You go on the north side, it could be, you know, 25, 29 percent because uh, the direct sun doesn't hit the north side of the houses in my neck of the woods. So you're going to find a lot of variability on that. With a deck, you're probably going to find variability between the spindles and the floor, whether it's close to the house, whether it's far away from the house, whether the sun hits it. So, okay, Chad, sound is good. All right, you guys uh, give me some kind of indication here. I'm sure we're not losing this one. So, okay. Uh, so basically, you can you can punch this guy in, and it'll basically give you you know a moisture reading instantly. And you can walk around, and you'll find that there's a lot of variability. There's uh, in most projects, you'll find twice the moisture in some area than not. So just be conscious of that, you know. Uh, but that will give you a good indication uh, professionally whether it's going to be able to accept stain or not. Uh, and there's a the tape test uh, as well. If, if the water soaks in and you still feel uh, a little bit iffy from your uh, water drop test, you can actually take a piece of blue tape, burnish it onto the surface, and pull it up. And if any, if any wood fiber is stuck to that back of that tape, you still need to remove that either mechanically or by washing. Okay, so your deck is prepped. It's, it's either stripped, chemically brightened, uh, we've sanded it. Uh, sanding is a great... Um, uh, it's not a great process, it's a, it's a mandatory process, is what I meant to say. All the manufacturers, they do recommend uh, not only that basic uh, sort of TSP and, uh, and bleach wash, they also recommend mechanically sanding as well. That will open up any uh, pores of that wood and make it acceptable uh, to, to stain. I found that anywhere between 60 and 120 grit is good, depending on the age of the deck. I've gone as low as 40 on that, but I found that it's going to leave some swirl marks with random orbital sanders, and you'll have to re-hit it with something between 80 and 120 to get rid of it. If you have a very, very rough deck, very old deck, got a little bit furry, uh, neglected, you'll probably have to start off with uh, some 80 to 100, and then maybe do a quick final with a 120 uh, just to do that. If you do 120 right away, or even 180 or 200, uh, it's way too fine. You're going to clog it right away, and it's just not going to be effective. Uh, so I found that, that that usually works out about the best. We sand it completely with that. Uh, for anybody who's done any woodworking uh, and wood finishing, fine wood finishing, I use card scrapers, which are basically metal credit cards with sharpened edges on them. And if you have, uh, if you have uh, corners, if you have steps, if you have areas where it's very, very hard uh, to, get, uh, to get a sander into, you can actually take these metal credit cards, these card scrapers, and shave the coatings off like that. So uh, that's something to consider too. That's a, that's a very good way. I, I use those when I refinish windows in, inside houses, and it does a very, very good job. So uh, you're ready to apply. Uh, all the manufacturers, they, they have recommendations for spraying and rolling. Uh, I see no benefit in spraying my decks. Uh, every manufacturer, there, it, it amazes me that there's still debates on uh, exterior painting, uh, deck finishing, about the efficiency and the effectiveness of uh, spraying versus, versus uh, brushing or rolling. Uh, there still seems to be a bit uh, debate about uh, brushing versus spraying, which surprises me because every manufacturer, without a doubt, minus some trim enamels, you must back brush, you must back roll all these finishes or back pad them into the deck. Uh, most. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say most, almost every bit of new construction I see, decks, uh, siding, this and that, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find one 
painting contractor in my area who sprays, who back brushes or back rolls. And I've, I've talked to all my paint reps, uh, the Sherwin Moon, the Benjamin Moore, the PPG, everybody else I can come into contact with, the Hirschfields, all that. Uh, not, they can count on, you know, each one of them calls on between two and 300 painting contractors. They'd be hard pressed to name three of their painting contractors that back brush and back roll regularly every, pr every project that they do. So basically, you're leaving out a very, very important portion of that, um, of that coating process. There's a chemical adhesion and there's a mechanical adhesion. The chemical adhesion is whatever the paint does or the coating does to the surface. The mechanical adhesion is making sure the pores are filled, making sure it's an even finish, and uh, you know just kind of saturating it and, and physically pressing it into the surface there. It's a very important process. Do not leave it out. Uh, for that reason, I usually pair up in, in twos or fours, and, and from a week ago, from finishing my own deck, I showed you guys a video and some images of how we do it. We pair up, one person on the outside of the spindles, one on the inside. We use hog bristle brushes. Uh, one is a Wooster offering, one is a Purdy or Purdy adjacent offering from Sherwin-Williams. Uh, both excellent brushes, very soft bristles, very accepting of oil stains. Uh, the new hybrids, the new water bases, uh, you can definitely use nylon or, or the equivalent uh, sort of brushes, but anytime you use an oil, these natural bristle brushes will prevent all the spitting and the kicking and the dripping. These hold it perfectly and release it excellent on, on the wood there. So these are relatively inexpensive. You can get them anywhere. Big box stores, hardware stores, professional paint stores. Uh, and, you know, for, for seven or eight bucks, you can get a really nice three-inch version, and it'll do three or four decks with washing in between. Another thing we do is, is with the cans here, uh, you can see I've, I've perforated this with a bunch of holes around the edges with a screwdriver. Uh, when we do clear, semi-transparent or semi-solid, it's a very thin, very watery kind of finish uh, made for penetrating. I punch those holes in there so that when we wipe our brushes on the can, all the excess material goes into the can and doesn't slide down the side and stain the deck. Uh, if you're doing all the spindles, you can get some drops on the deck. You come back and do the floor, those drops will still be there. You're basically adding each time a, a drop or a coat goes on. So you got to be careful for aesthetic reasons uh, for that reason. So I, I punch those little holes in there so it drains in there. Obviously, with solid color stains, they're more paint-like, and they're probably not going to drain in there, so you just have to be more careful with those. Uh, I have experimented with spraying over the years. The amount of extra prep you have to do to the surrounding area in the house definitely negates any benefits of that, especially when you consider if you do it right, which we all want to, you have to back brush your back roll. So it, it's just not something that I've done. And you know, with my deck, I think it took, you know, four of us, uh, five of us, maybe an hour, hour and 15 minutes to stain this thing. It's just, I, I don't see the benefit in it for, for a lot of the structures that I run into. There are applications where I'm sure it does make sense. Nothing that I've run into. So. And people use a lot of pads and other stuff. Again, a pad's not going to get into the grooves on the deck, and it's not going to be useful at all for the spindle. So we just use the, a good brush and, and end up doing it that way. So, okay, stains. <coughs> the basics of stains for your deck. Oils break down in weather and deteriorate over the years. That's how, they, that's how the life of an oil product looks like. A water-based product or the new hybrid stuff has more film integrity, and it delaminates over the years. It stays more in, intact, but it'll come off in chunks. So it, it, the old adage is, you know, the, the oil weathers away, the, the water-based stuff peels off. Pretty much true for this too. At least think about it that way. Three basic types of stains right now that you can choose from. There's the traditional oil, uh, there's pure water-based stuff, and then there's new hybrid stuff, which is basically an emulsion of water and oil. And uh, over the last maybe two or three years, I've been experimenting with a lot of the new hybrid offerings. Um, the feel, the look, the smell, the application, the drying time, the, all this and that, pretty good. Uh, fairly reminiscent of, uh, of the old oil stains. I'm still a fan of oil. The only problem is I get the feeling that a lot of companies are not putting R&D money or, or furthering the technology of oil only because of VOC laws, um, uh, environmental regulations. Eventually we're going to have to go to either hybrids or waters anyway, so I think that they're sort of letting themselves phase out. And for that reason, I've completely stopped using oil-based solid color finishes. They do not last like they used to. I used to stain, you know, 20 houses a year with uh, with Cabot and, uh, and Sickens and a uh, lot of other solid color And within a year or two now, uh, it doesn't matter what color, they almost always fade. And I have a feeling they're just remnants of a, of a bygone era. So I've, I've almost completely switched over to water-based solids. But 
the hybrids are, are doing pretty good. I actually worked with Cabot a couple years ago on devising a two-coat process uh, for some of their semi-solids or, or semi-transparents and, uh, and uh, translucent stains. They're technically only supposed to be a one-coat uh, coverage. The, the problem is there's a, a wax-like or wax-e sort of substance when it comes to these uh, you know, uh, uh, hybrid systems. They've taken out the oil resins. They have to replace it with something. Uh, that will actually prevent water from getting in the wood. You can either use acrylic resins, you can use oil resins, you can use some hybrid in between, other chemicals. A component of that is either wax or a wax-like substance where if you, the theory was, if you coat an entire cedar house with a, with a Cabot semi-solid hybrid stain, you really should just do one coat. I know from all my experience, that you do need two coats. One coat, it's gonna soak in different areas. The second coat will build an even color, even shine. So I worked with uh, my cabinet representative, uh, I think it was two summers ago, to devise a two coat system. They devised against it because of this waxy system. If you let it dry and go for another coat, their fear that there was gonna be delamination, uh, no intercoat adhesion. Uh, we did a whole bunch of tests. I did some real world stuff on this huge cedar house out in the country, and we, we devised a good system of a two of a two coat process. Uh, as long as we hit it within a certain amount of time, I think it was a number of days, uh, and the weather conditions were right, and we applied it with brush and all this other stuff, we had very, very good success with this stuff. So these hybrids are promising, and I assume in 10 years we will probably have a couple cedar oils or natural color oils left on the market. Almost everything will probably either be pure acrylic or a hybrid, and I hope there's still the hybrid version, because uh, I have not seen success with water-based uh, finishes on decks yet. So, um, the opacities. So we have the oil, we have the water-based, and we have the hybrid. There's basically only three opacities that I deal with. There's a whole bunch in there. Uh, it, it, especially when you get into what used to be seconds, which is now phasing into PPG, Prolux, uh, they have a completely different thought process. Three coat systems, two coat systems, log oils, things like that. 95% of the outdoor wood structures that I deal with, you can either do with a transparent oil with cedar or natural like I have, you can do a semi-solid or something of the like, or a solid. Um, those are your basically three opacities. If, something, if somebody's asking for something outside of that, uh, it's going to be a very specific niche sort of product, and you'll probably end up having to do your research on it anyway. Uh, okay, so we went over the, uh, the application, uh, setting, climate, everything else is very important when you're doing decks here too. Uh, spring, <coughs> excuse me, if you can keep the, the rain away, is a perfect time. It's usually cool, it's usually uh, not that breezy out. Uh, cool days, cool nights, things like that. Gives you a lot of open time with this. I usually uh, do a whole bunch of decks, uh, spring and early summer, take care of my houses in the winter, throw in a deck here or there, and then do a whole bunch of decks early fall. Uh, we can't go too late in the fall here because all the leaves fall on the decks, uh, but it's nice and cool, and cool gives you that sort of open time. Uh, in the uh, late April, uh, May, things like that, it tends to be overcast here quite a bit. As you can see, we're sort of working with a day in the mid-40s here, high-40s. Uh, overcast is just starting to get a little bit lighter out. This is perfect weather for decks. In the sun, on the south side of a house, 86 degree day, 20 mile an hour wind. You couldn't ask for a worse way to stay in a deck. I have done it before when it's cool, a version of that. When it gets hot too, you're combining direct sunlight and the heat, and it's just, it dries too fast, you're gonna get lap marks all over. So I usually try to hit those decks first thing in the morning. You go six in the morning to 10 in the morning, something like that, or last thing in the day. And a lot of it has to depend on what side of the house that it's on too. If you have a south side deck, we're gonna be out there at 5.36 in the morning. We're gonna get that thing done. As soon as that dew's gone, we're gonna get that deck done, and it's gonna be nice and cool, nice wet edge maintained, and it's all gonna soak in. Uh, if it's the north side, we'll usually do south side decks in the morning, and then we'll, try, uh, we'll migrate over to north side decks. Uh, at least in my neck of the woods, the north is uh, basically shady all, all day, so we'll, we'll head there and do those then. So, um, keep your wet edge, uh, especially with translucent stains like this. Like I mentioned, if you're going around, and I always do the spindles first, outside first, inside second, uh, in sections, in, in physical sections when you go around, uh, you have to keep drips off the deck. When, when I do the spindles, we drop cloth the floor of the deck with clean, dust-free, paint chip-free drop cloths. Uh, we do all the spindles, we get that off again, uh, 
it'll be dust free again if we use our good drop cloths and then we do the floor any drip any run from your can that stays on the floor you'll be able to see it'll translate through into that coat because uh, basically you've left a dot you put another coat over it it's going to get darker every time you go over it and it's a little bit unsightly especially when you're doing a brand new deck if you're doing an older deck it gives you a little bit of leeway it's got some old stuff got some wear and tear not a big deal but you have to be careful of that uh, rain uh, never stay in the deck uh, if it rained in the previous 24 hours or if there's a good chance it's going to rain in the next 24 hours. Uh, not a very good thing to do. Uh, a whole bunch of years ago, uh, there was talk of products from Sherwin-Williams, and there still is from Sherwin-Williams, and Benjamin Moore about washing and staining a deck in a day. Products where you could physically wash it in the morning, deck could still be damp, and you put some product on. Uh, <laughs> Without naming uh, a particular uh, paint rep or things like that, they have all come back to me and said that was a complete disaster. Don't ever do this. And uh, I hate to say common sense, but it, you, you, you don't have to tell a professional that you shouldn't stay in a wet or damp deck. Uh, good in theory. Uh, the only benefit of that is the contractor doesn't have to come back another day. There's no benefit to the homeowner. And for those of you who have known or listened to me or watched me long enough, you understand that the homeowner's wishes and the homeowner's, uh, you know, uh, uh, well-being is, is put first, and then I figure out a way to do the highest quality finish and still try to make money and, and pay my mortgage doing it. So um, I shook my head when I heard about these. Paint reps have come to me uh, recently, and they've basically been said, yeah, that's not, a, that's not a way to do it. We've had some complete disasters with decks where we gathered 30 contractors together. We all did one together, and... Uh, it, yeah, it all came off within months. So don't do that. There's, there's no benefit to doing that at all. Uh, gang up your work. Uh, if, you, if you want to wash and stain a deck in a day, wash four decks in a day and stain four decks the next day. You don't have to do them all in one day like that. It's, it's, you can separate that out. You, there's nothing that says you have to stay where you washed and then keep staining. So uh, rain. A bunch of years ago, maybe four or five years ago, I actually experimented with oil on my own deck uh, it was a Friday, had a little bit extra time with the crew. Uh, we came over, we prepped my deck, we stained it, knowing that that night it was going to rain. It was eminent, 90, 100% chance of rain. And I thought, you know what, this is oil. Let's test the boundaries of how far this can go. Uh, we stained it just like normal. It was a, uh, it was a Cabot uh, wood-toned uh, deck and siding oil like that, a natural color, uh, about the standard natural colored oil. Uh, poured all night, hazy the next day, cool. By, by Sunday afternoon, by Monday, it all dried out. I came back out here, and the only thing that seemed to be affected was at the bottom of these spindle sections, there's the, uh, there's the board that holds the bottom of the spindle. The, the stain that went on there was a little bit thicker than the rest of the deck. Um, and that's the only part that stayed a little bit tacky yet. Nothing else was affected. The water beat it up perfectly, and, uh, you know, basically when it dried off, a uh, couple little water spots from, you know, uh, whatever contaminants were in the rainwater, but otherwise it was perfect. And so, you know, not a, not the worst thing that can happen, but definitely just, you know, with a water-based finish, I wouldn't even attempt it. Number one, I wouldn't use a water-based finish unless it was a solid on a deck. Uh, and number two, uh, I, I wouldn't mess around with that rain. That, that could be a complete disaster. So, uh, maintenance. Now we're going to get into the big portion of this. How long does this stuff last? Uh, basically, the only thing more important to a homeowner than the cost of the project is, how long am I going to have to do this stuff? Uh, and I've actually compiled a little list here. I'm going to go through this with you guys. Uh, I went through uh, all the major stain manufacturers. Uh, I put together a, a spreadsheet of how long everything lasts. Uh, the manufacturers that weren't brave enough to put their numbers out there, I contacted uh, my, my particular rep for each one, and I got their basic you know, uh, uh, thumbnail sketch of what, uh, what we should be looking at. So I, uh, for, for ease uh, and, and for what most of us use for the coatings, Cabot, Sherwin-Williams, Benjamin Moore, and what was Sickens uh, is now PPG Prolux, uh, my three uh, kind of categories, we have the translucents, we have the semi-solids, and then we have the solids. Um, all the natural or cedar, the transparent, everyone said it should be recoded in one year. There were two manufacturers that said you could go two years, and that's Cabot and Sherwin-Williams. Uh, they both said that. Now, I, I will throw in some caveats later that will basically negate this entire list, but here are their recommendations. Um, for semi-solids, 
uh, either uh, oil or hybrid. We have uh, Cabot as three to six years, uh, Sherwin Williams two to four years, Benjamin Moore two to three years, and Sickens, which was one year. Uh, and then solid color acrylic. I've switched to acrylics uh, only that, you know, for the reason I, I, I like the solid color oils, especially the decking stains that have a little bit of shine to them. I don't feel that they are what they were five or ten years ago, so I've switched to acrylics with, with really good results. Again, I do not want to do a deck with a solid color. I will do everything I can up to the point where the homeowner just says, I just want that done. Then I will completely brief them on how it goes, how it's going to look in a couple years. Um, solid color acrylics, Cabot, five to ten years. Sherwin-Williams, four to ten. Benjamin Moore, two to five. And Sickens, PPG Prolux, two to three. Uh, I feel that Sickens is probably the most honest and accurate out of all these. When a company says that your deck, you know, will look good in five to ten years with two coats of a solid color acrylic decking stain, uh, not sure what the criteria is there, but I guarantee you most homeowners would call you. If, if you told them that five years from now, after I put two coats on this deck, depending on which side it's facing, which neck of the woods you're in, I would guess that the homeowners would have some questions for you. If you said, this deck will look exactly like the day I left it, when I finished it five years from now, it will not, and that's just the truth. Uh, depending on wear and tear, depending on sun, UV rays, and water, um, it's going to look much. It, it's going to look much different. And, and to push that out to ten years, there will be a couple spindles that look good <laughs> ten years later. But I guarantee you, the handrails and the floors uh, will not look that good. So, here's what I've found in 24 years of doing this. Every manufacturer will tell you every 12 months with a translucent finish. And I, I counsel every single one of my homeowners. Uh, the majority of decks I do, somebody puts up a new cedar deck and they say, I want, it, I want it to look like this new cedar for the rest of its life. Number one, it's not possible because of UV aging. The wood will just darken naturally. Number two, uh, if you apply a natural or a clear oil, it will darken it with each coat you put on. So even if you put the, the most translucent, the most clear finish that you can on there, every coat you put on is going to deepen it a little bit. And, you know, wood is just going to weather naturally anyway. So a combination of that, yes, it will be bright, it, it will be good, but you're going to have to do something every summer without a doubt. It's going to be washing, it's going to be sanding, it's going to be coating, and you're not going to get away from that. And it's a huge undergoing for a lot of these decks. They're building them on the second story. There's a triple kink stairwell. Sometimes the stairwells come down a flight, they break off. There's another section of the deck. It is a huge project. Most people don't want to go through the time or the expense to coat every year like that. It's fairly expensive to do the right way. So uh, most people, what I found is that three years later they'll call me and they say, well, we're ready for another coat and you sort of have to start the restoration project, give it a little bit more work. The deck will never be the same as when you coat it always. Now, I have never seen a, uh, I've coated this deck excessively. Uh, I, it must be seven to nine years I've had it now. I want to say eight. Uh, the first two years, I put two coats of stain on it uh, each summer, spring and fall, uh, to see if I could build up that nice deep finish on it. Then every year since, I've done exactly like the manufacturers recommend, with the washing, uh, a tiny bit of sanding. I've stopped sanding the last three or four years because it's basically just finish on here. It's like a hardwood floor where you basically just soap and water it off and you get the dirt off. But I've coated it exactly like the manufacturers recommend. When I restored my house, I was uh, experimenting with some chemistry, and uh, I took about, you know, there must have been somewhere between 10 and 14 coats of oil stain on here, and I stripped it all off just to see if I could uh, efficiently. I, I know I can strip it off if, you, if, you, if time is not an element. But uh, effectively, quickly, coming up with this different chemistry here, uh, you can do that uh, fairly effectively. And uh, you know, I took the you know 10 to 14 coats of oil stain off, and I started over with a with a little bit thicker product, a new offering uh, from Cabot. So, uh, natural oils, at least in my neck of the woods, you're going to have to be honest with your homeowners, and homeowners be honest with yourself every year if you want that deck to be superior, meticulously spotless, perfect, just like you want it every year. Semi-solids, we start breaking off into, into some different categories here where, you know, I would say three years on average is about a good one. You're going to see a lot of wears and wear and tear on the handrails, tops of the handrails on the floor. And then solids, I would say it's about the same, maybe three years, because what it's not going to fade as much as semi-solids, but you're going to start getting delamination when water gets underneath it. Now, especially think about the floors here. 
These floors, you can do the most superior coating job uh, you can to the top, but you're leaving a bare underside of wood there. And at least on my north side of the house, there's just gravel and, and pea rock and river rock under here so the weeds don't grow. It is very moist soil under there. I doubt it dries out at all. So on hot days, you're going to get a lot of that humidity rising up from the ground right through the bottom of the deck. And all these manufacturers, there's a couple caveats. I'll read you some here. They give you these uh, recommendations, and then, well, the homeowners come back and say, well, you know, I, I coated my deck just like they said, and it's not working out well. There's a couple caveats they throw in that uh, <laughs> it's basically their way of getting out of any of this we'll pay for your deck sort of thing is you're supposed to coat all six sides of the board, which, I mean, you can't take this deck apart and coat it. End grain, too. It, it's just not going to happen. So basically, if you did not do that, you probably have no recourse with a lot of these stain companies. Uh, number two, I'll actually read this to you here. Uh, one of the most interesting things that I've seen, and I've only seen this added maybe in the last five years, uh, I'm going to read you a standard sort of uh, application or maintenance thing, and then I'm going to show you one line in these things that I found that was very interesting that I've seen pop up in the last five years. Okay, uh, generally, uh, I took this from one manufacturer, but it's vice versa, it's about the same for all of them. Over application of this product may result in a glossy appearance, poor drying or sagging. Do not apply in direct sunlight on hot surfaces or when air temp is below 50 or may fall below 50 for 48 hours. Do not, over, uh, do not apply over wet or damp surfaces or when rain is imminent. Do not intermix with any other products. Do not thin. Do not apply over previously painted or sealed surfaces. Exterior use only. So basically, they want a perfectly bare piece of wood uh, prepped. This is something interesting. Um, if if the, the, the best thing you can tell your homeowners is exactly what the can says as far as this. Well, they say, well, how long can you guarantee this? And I'll say, well, listen, Appearance is one thing. Technically, this product will be protecting your deck a year from now. It's not going to look the same a year from now. And this line, <laughs> if you look into the maintenance regimen, it says, evaluate finish, finish each spring and maintain as needed. That's basically their way of saying, you're probably going to have to do something every year. Another, another, <laughs> another manufacturer uh, version of the same thing. To maintain the product's protective characteristics, Apply a maintenance coat when visibly required. So basically, yes, they give you, hey, this could last 10 years, 5 to 10 years. Uh, this is a one-year application. They put in the caveat at the end of it. When it looks like it needs it, just do it. So basically, there's no warranty through any of this stuff. So as a contractor, you know, I don't warranty any of my coating because you're warrantying everything that's ever been done to a, to a house. Like this house is 100 years. I'd be warrantying everything that's ever been done to this house for 100 years. I'd be warrantying the insulation. I'd be warrantying how the homeowners use it. I'd be warrantying what the weather does to it. Same thing with decks. I have never run into a problem with decks. Is I have a very standard briefing that I run my, my homeowners to, that if you want this deck to be maintained, you're going to have to do something every year or every two years. Most of the time, I counsel my homeowners to do the full restoration. Your deck probably needs it. Go through, chemically brighten it, strip it if you need to. Get that good coat of oil stain on there if you can. And then the next year, the spindles probably won't need it, but the tops of the handrails and the floor will need it. So coat just the tops of the handrails or the whole handrail and the floor. And then that'll get you to the next year where maybe you can do it in another entire coat. And then after that, maybe you can just go on every other year. But at a minimum, if you want a cedar-colored deck like mine, you're going to have to do the horizontal surfaces every year, no matter what. There's just not a way around it. If you don't care what it looks like, don't bother that. You know, you can just let the deck go gray and, it, and it's not an issue. But homeowners expect this and you have to be honest with them and tell them what it takes to get this. And even when you do that, even when they nod their head and agree, they will wait three to four years and call you and say, my deck's turned gray and now we need to do it over. It's just human nature. No harm, no foul. It just is what it is. It, I, I, I perfectly understand it's reasonable to do that because it's an expensive process and it's something where you have to drag the grill off and all that other stuff and, and that's fine. Uh, why decks fail? Uh, and then I'll go through a whole bunch of questions you guys have. Improper maintenance schedule. Number one, bar none, the biggest reason why decks fail, they aren't kept up. Just like the oil changes in your car, they have not come out with an oil that goes 50,000 miles yet with no change and no lack of performance. The deck is the same thing. You can't once every eight years go through this huge process and then hope it to last eight years again. Every year, every other year, every three years, every four years, you got to get on the right maintenance regimen and just keep it up. There's just not a better way to do it. Uh, and, and anybody who's been to the dentist, we all get that information. And even of us, those of us who maybe maintain our decks or our cars or whatever perfectly, 
we don't always maintain everything perfectly. So it, it's understandable if the deck gets thrown by the wayside. Poor prep. Uh, getting rid of everything that stain won't stick to and making a good surface is, the, uh, is probably number two on the list why decks fail. Uh, poor materials. Uh, in recent years, you know, we're using new growth wood. A lot of the, uh, the, the wood, you'll find little sap bubbles still coming out of it. You'll find that uh, it sits in a pile. It's wet when they put it on. They have to bend it into place. It's new growth wood. It's not as stable as old growth wood. The siding on my house is, is 100 years old uh, when it was put on. Well, it's been sitting here for 100 years. It could have been 200 years old when it was put on. So basically, you could be looking at a 300-year-old piece of wood here from the middle of a huge, huge redwood or heart pine tree. The stuff is straight-grained. The growth rings are super close together. It's super stable. It holds a coating well. This stuff, <laughs> there's not many growth rings. You can count the growth rings pretty easily. Some of these boards, you know, they're, they're six inches wide, and you'll find six growth rings across them, and that's, that's not the case. And in a six-inch board with this old growth siding, you can find you know, 80 of them, something like that. So uh, this wood is going to move a lot. It's going to cup, it's going to warp, and now you're laying it flat and exposing it to the elements. There's going to be a lot of movement, a lot of moisture migration, cracking, things like that. Uh, UV. Uh, I used to think water was the worst possible thing that could happen to a house or a deck. Uh, I have completely flipped on that. It is, it is a horrible thing to happen to your house, not nearly as bad as ultraviolet rays from the sun. It, it chemically, physically degrades a coating sort of without you seeing it. It's sort of the silent killer of a, of a paint or a coating. It just over time, the ultraviolet rays just physically break a product down, and that's where you'll see failure. Um, mill glaze and that wax pressure treatment, like I mentioned before. <coughs> that kind of goes along the line of prep. And then uh, <laughs> I always throw this one in human error because you almost never get a bad gallon of stain or a bad gallon of paint. A lot of people like to say, well, my house peeled, I got a bad gallon of paint. I've only been in, involved in one, maybe two major paint recalls where things have physically gone wrong at the house over 24 years. So it's always human error. If something went wrong, I almost say, well, a human got involved with it, so it probably went wrong. <coughs> so that, that's usually what I, you know, a human error can kind of apply to all that stuff. So uh, miscellaneous stuff, the hardwood decking, quickly I'll run into that. Exotics, same prep process, same chemical process. Uh, a lot of manufacturers recommend that you actually wipe them down with acetone or rubbing alcohol to break down any of the oils, the natural oils they have in there. Uh, I've done experiments with doing that and with just the standard treating it like pine or cedar, and I've had the exact same result. Maybe I got a bunch of decks that didn't have a whole bunch of natural oil in it, but uh, as long as you follow the correct maintenance schedule, I've seen no drop off in performance if you do not rub them down with acetone. So from my point of view. Uh, composite deckings, all the Trex decking, all the uh, uh, fiber and, and sort of plastic composite decking. I've stained a couple of those in my days. Uh, again, I would rather not, but the homeowners requested it and uh, they were very early versions of composite decking, so they weren't, they didn't even look like wood, they were just sort of plasticky planks. And uh, I've had great luck with those. They, they're actually very, very accepting of stain if they're old enough. And most of the time when somebody calls you, they're gonna be old enough. So uh, they do make specific composite decking stains. Uh, a lot of the new hybrid uh, versions of these stains say they can be used on them. Just do tests. Okay? That, that's the best thing you can do. You're only gonna run into it once every three to five years if you're a professional like me. And it's one of those things where in three to five years, the products are gonna all be different. So don't spend a lot of time looking into that stuff. Somebody asked for a composite decking done, go to the big three or four manufacturers, see what their offerings are, talk to the paint reps, and then just go from there. So, all right, I'm going to run through some uh, questions quick. I know it's going to be a long show today, but I, uh, if nothing else, I just want to get this down uh, on the internet, uh, on my page, so that people can reference this deck episode, especially this time of year uh, when decks are a very popular product. So, uh, Rick McKagan, uh, a fellow pro, uh, prior to staining, when would you recommend using a wood conditioner or stripper to prep the surface? Every time. Uh, on decks, even where you think you can't uh, bump, bump them lighter, I still, it takes 10 minutes to downstream some, uh, some chemicals in there through my pressure washer. Get it on there quick. If nothing else, it's just a good way to clean everything off. Uh, put a little oxalic acid, a little bit of TSP, a little something in there. Uh, even just soap sometimes does a great job. Uh, Frank Bowen, uh, <laughs> Nick. Should you leave your new boards weather for a season or should you stain them? Covered that in the first one here. Don't leave them weather. If you do leave them weather, you're still gonna have to go through the prep process. Thank you, Grandpa Frank, for that one. I do appreciate it. Uh, Sarah Perryman, uh, 
a very handy person as far as the houses go. Uh, we are going to be installing tongue and groove Douglas fir boards on our covered porch. It's open-sided, so it will be exposed to the elements. The traditional treatment for this application is to be painted. Is there any benefits of using a solid color stain uh, instead of paint in this area? How long will you expect uh, the finish uh, to last before it needs to be redone? If using paint, uh, should it be primed on all sides during, uh, including the tongue and groove? Yes, and for those of you who've been following uh, the hashtag Cottage Cabin Project, there's, I did tongue and groove uh, beadboard inside the house, tongue and groove beadboard outside of the house, and we used a stain killing primer on the back sides of it all. We did all the tongues, and then we put them up, and then we stain kill primed the front of them too. This was for uh, speed. Uh, because this project is you know, almost four hours away from me, I quickly did all that for the homeowner so they could put it up. Uh, if I had my way, I would pre-finish all that in the shop, uh, almost to the last uh, coat, and put all that stuff up. But oil primer, number one, if you're, especially if you're putting Douglas fir up there, that's going to have a lot of sap, a lot of tannin, a lot of resin. Uh, oil primer would be my number one choice. There are a, a bunch of nice water blocking stain primers out there now that in the short term, I've seen them block stains as well as oil. The long term of it, I, I'm not sure yet. I haven't seen one go 10, 15 years yet to see if those knots migrated through yet. So uh, water base, and, and yes, uh, not only for the stability of the wood, but with the tongue and groove, you know, you have your, your tongue and your groove on those planks like this. Uh, seasonally, these are gonna move like that, and you're gonna expose bare wood if you don't coat those tongues and grooves. So I get in there and either work it in brush, roller, or spray, uh, get those tongues and grooves so when they expand, it's exposing painted surface, not bare wood surface. Uh, and, it's, and like I said, especially if you have tongue and grooves, Sarah, uh, get it stain killed if you're gonna paint it. Uh, number two, no benefit of using a uh, solid color stain. In fact, if it's gonna be a painted surface, I almost always use, it, use paint instead of uh, a solid color stain, uh, even on sidings of houses. Decks are the only thing. Uh, I, I feel that some of the stain offerings tend to last a little bit longer. Some of the paints, the 100% acrylic, elastomerics, are too rubbery uh, for decks, and I feel that they, they peel quite often. So um, traditionally, yes, paint. Uh, I would use a uh, either a very, very high quality flat, low luster, get into the duration, the emerald, the aura, things like that. Uh, if you do it right, uh, the worst thing that's going to happen to those is you're going to get a wasp nest or a cobweb or something on there. Uh, it'll basically go forever. Uh, there's farmhouses out in the country here where I've restored the beadboard, and the worst thing that happens to it is that, you know, nine layers of paint ago, they used a brittle oil, and now it starts to alligator a little. But the UV never directly comes into contact with it, and water, if, if it's installed right, will never come in contact with it. So it's basically the best case scenario for that paint. Besides a little bit of washing and, and maintaining it and getting the dust off it, uh, indefinite. Uh, you know, it's going to get dirty before it goes bad for sure. So, uh, thank you, Sarah, for that one. Uh, Shane Sexsmith, uh, do you prefer chemical or mechanical stripping? I do both, almost always both. Um, I try to strip all the chemicals off, or uh, try to uh, strip all the finish off with chemicals. Uh, but then you always have to sand it. Uh, sanding to me is just to get rid of some furry wood or some soft spots there, but it's gonna be way easier to get rid of a coating uh, chemically than it is with uh, mechanical means. Uh, Brett Paisano, uh, do you soft wash and downstream or use an X-Jet, uh, straight sodium hypochlorite or a chemical mix? Uh, I downstream, uh, there's a whole bunch of, I know there's whole forums dedicated to this sort of thing and guys are totally into gallons per minute uh, you know, uh, different tips, uh, chemical mixes, this and that. What I've gone through here today, if you're a standard residential repainter like me who caters to homeowners and their needs and their businesses, you're not going to find anything that you can't do with what I talked about today. A lot of very specific things there. Uh, I use uh, turbo nozzles, uh, wobble tips, uh, and I have all the different colors and nozzles, uh, including soap tips that I use on my pressure washer. I have not found a deck that I can't sort of conquer with that sort of multi-tool uh, that I have there. And uh, I use a lot of, uh, in combination, for 10 years I've used uh, the pre-mix sort of strippers and wood brighteners from uh, big box stores, hardware stores, paint stores, things like that. I, I, because I'm interested in it, I wanted to make my own, so I got the bulk chemicals. Um, sodium hydroxide comes in a crystal form like this. Uh, this this is in the water very well. Uh, uh, and uh, like I said, the oxalic acid like this. I've always bought this in smaller little containers, but I went right to the source and got some bulk stuff so I can just keep it in and, and measure it out and, and mix it up and, and run it through. So 
Um, that's sort of, I try to keep it simple like that, Brett. You know, you can really get mired down in, in pressure and tips and gadgets and things like that. And honestly, if we're all honest with ourselves, um, this is pretty in-depth. And a lot of pros don't even do this. Uh, it seems like it from social media that everybody's out there doing this. I have not run into another pro in my life, in my area, around here in Minnesota, that uses any of this stuff. I'm sure they do, I just don't see it, but especially around here, I've never even ran into a homeowner that said, oh yeah, we had a pro, they used oxalic acid, they used uh, sodium hydroxide, and then they washed and they sent. This is in depth, <laughs> and it's the right way to do it, but it's, it's the simplest form of a very complicated process. So hope that, hap uh, hope that helps out, Brad. If you've got any other suggestions too, or something I overlooked, uh, you pros just chime in. And let me know a lot of a lot of information here i'm trying to get through today so uh rise residential painting uh, from instagram failing oil-based finishes are, are where some of the finish is still intact do you need to fully strip uh, if so what do you do about water staining or tannin bleeding on a cedar tongue and groove ceilings uh thanks nick love the show watch it every saturday well thank you so much i, I do appreciate it um no, uh, I don't. Uh, I basically brief my homeowners again. When we talked about reasonable restoration, there's the thing where you slap on a coat of one paint with no prep. There's a kind where you take it down to bare wood. Somewhere in the middle is where the homeowner wants it. Same thing with the deck. If we could do every deck, strip it all down to bare wood, start over with a three coat system and do it, that's fine. Tons of money, most homeowners aren't gonna do it. So what I do is I brief my homeowners. Uh, depending on the finish they want. And again, like I said, when I first meet with my homeowners, I say, what do you want the deck to look like? And then I fi figure out if within a reasonable amount of time and money, I can get that for them. If I can't, then I start saying, okay, well, here's, here's my standard deck washing, sanding, cleaning, staining process. If you want to completely take it down to bare wood, then you have this other thing we can do over here. Here's the price difference, here's the time difference, here's what you have to expect in the future, maintenance regimen, things like that. And, and again, I, I come out there, I do the free estimate, I put a little skin in the game, I leave the ball in their court, they have to then do uh, the heavy lifting and then say, what are we willing to accept? When they give me that decision, they are, they are almost always comfortable with it. There's a few people who probably uh, aren't, uh, go against their better judgment, but uh, if they make the call, it will almost always be right, at least in their mind. And, and that's who, after all, we're all looking out for. So, uh, And I leave, a lot of the times, when you have a deck like mine here, uh, honestly, uh, pros who've been doing it longer than a year or two, you realize like the spindles are going to be in really good shape most of the time. They don't get the UV, they don't get a lot of the standing rain. It's the handrails and the floors and the steps that are going to need it. So basically, I'll say, well, you know, if we pick the right product, and we, we wash whatever comes off, we sand whatever comes off, and get it all prepped. If you pick the right product, it'll blend in with the stain that stays, and, and it'll coat the new areas, and it'll, it won't be perfect, but it'll all blend in. But if you brief your homeowner on this and tell them that's what the end result is gonna be, they won't be surprised. If you tell them, oh yeah, brand new deck, we'll just we'll stain it, it'll look great, they're, they're under the impression that this is gonna be a completely uniform, perfect deck. If they want to spring the extra money to remove all the stuff from the spindles, I'm fine with it. But again, it's half of this process is stripping and sanding and finishing. The other half is just maintaining uh, expectations with the homeowners and making sure they know what's going on. Uh, and then the, the tannin bleeding on the tongue and groove, uh, very common uh, thing to happen. What happens is you have a porch, you have a, a deck, you have a, a three season porch, a, a screened in porch. It's got the tongue and groove ceiling. You go to wash it, get the cobwebs off, dust off, things like that. When the water pools, the tannin will bleed into those drops and you'll have drops all over. Two things you can do about this. I have those uh, squeegees on mop handles like that, those kind of uh, squeegees that they use on gym floors and things like that, rubberized foam. And first rake all the water off. And then while everything's still wet, I have my apprentices get up there with terry cloth towels, uh, sometimes even microfiber if we can get them big enough. And they just quick give it a wipe down like that so there's no standing water. Uh, and then before we leave the job, we'll go check it once more again uh, just to make sure that there's nothing left there. So and and. <coughs> yeah, you, you've definitely been doing this more than a day because that is a very, very common concern. 
Uh, you know, anybody who's sort of washed the covered porch with tongue and groove pine that's been stained natural, you come back to stain it later and there's all sorts of these crazy orange dots all over where the tannin has migrated uh, from there into the water droplets as a vehicle and now it's stained it like that. And it's very difficult to get rid of. You almost either have to, uh, you know, I've tried mineral spirits afterwards, I've tried wiping it down with different things, but it sort of messes with the finish and it's not, it, it's a lot harder. If you hit it while it's still wet and, and just make sure it's a uniform damp surface instead of drips and runs, uh, that almost always solves it for me, especially with the worst ones there. So hope that helps out. And then Todd Hill, um, he sent some pictures here too, very interesting project he's working on, a uh, contractor from Colorado. Uh, Todd actually sent me one of his favorite brushes, and uh, we're finishing up a house where I'm using it on today. It's, a, it's an awesome brush, I'll, I'll go through it again in another episode. House has cedar siding with semi-transparent oil on it. As you can see, the sun has darkened the areas on the siding. Uh, she doesn't want uh, to use semi-solid or solid body stain, but wants to go back to the original color. What would you recommend? And uh, he's planning on using an Arbor Coat product. So, um, on one of my Ask a Painters last year, I was on a lake not far from here, and I completely restored the log home. Uh, I used a combination of off-the-shelf strippers and some homemade chemistry that I made up with, uh, with sodium hydroxide, things like that. If you mix it up to, a, to what is considered a hot percentage, uh, I think they recommend up to about 12 or 13 percent of the sodium hydroxide with water. I experimented with up to 20, and basically you just get diminishing returns. You're just making the wood soft and furry, and it's not taking the uh, uh, a coating off any better. So, uh, what I found is actually a combination of both. Now, if you just mix up water and sodium hydroxide, you know the stripper uh, that I was talking about, uh, it tends to be watery, dries out quick. You can either mix in a little bit of soap with it, detergent, something like that. But what I found to be even more effective than soap is I carry around <coughs> a gallon or two of the pre-mixed wood stripper and I actually mix a little bit of that in and it's a real gooey, jelly, sort of slimy, thick, uh, viscous uh, solution and that'll actually thicken up the whole thing. It, it's a very concentrated version. So when I have a five gallon bucket of the sodium hydroxide mixed up, I'll put in you know, maybe a quart of the pre-made stripper in there and it tightens up that whole mixture and it makes it sort of uh, sticky and, and it makes it wetter. Uh, stays wetter for longer and then I'll spray that on the side of the house with I have a backpack sprayer kind of Ghostbuster style where it's got the hand pump and you spray I have a whole bunch of smaller garden sprayers uh, I've tried downstreaming uh, through my pressure washer but it kind of dilutes it a little bit I don't like that so I like to just hand apply it I've even done it with brushes where we've had hard to reach places or areas where there's a whole bunch of sensitive materials around there we've used scrub brushes and five gallon buckets full of it and just brushed it on like that with pretty good results as long as you keep it wet so Todd, I would do, obviously you want to go for a test area. Do, uh, I try to find the south side, at least here, that's where you're going to get the worst exposure. I go to the south side, I try a little bit of the oxalic acid in one area, I try the stripper in the other area, combination thereof, and see what works. Uh, normally on the south side, you can get by with just the wood brightener, because most of the finish has degraded. What you're going to find is on the north side, a lot of the finish is still going to be there and shiny and things like that, so strip it all down. Uh, you can do a lighter version of a stripper as well to get rid of any kind of hard to reach things, but it is a very time consuming process. If that homeowner wants a perfectly new or as close to new as you can cedar home, no defects, no old stains, no grain, you're going to have to strip it, you're going to have to chemically brighten the whole house, uh, and then you're probably going to have to go back and sand a lot of it because the, the, the sodium hydroxide, if you do this wrong, this will turn everything black. Well, it, it will darken the wood anyway, that's why I use a brightener. So I'm not going to say you're doing anything wrong if it turns black, but uh, it will turn it very dark. Uh, in a lot of cases, if you do it wrong uh, or let it sit too long, it's going to just completely demolish that wood, make it so furry that it's going to be hard to stand. So you have to be care very careful with stuff like that. And then uh, if you use an Arbor Coat, obviously, I'm a big fan of oils. So if she wants the translucent version of that, the traditional oil, I think they even call it now traditional oil, uh, things like that. And uh, that would be the way to go with that, a couple coats of that. Uh, recently, I've been, uh, well, that the last log home I did, I actually used a Sickens product, and now it's PPG Prolux, but they're sort of known for their log coatings, and some of their log oils can approach, you know, at 90 to 110 $120 a gallon, so, you know, you got to be careful what you use, but it is a two-coat system then. Uh, it's a very thick, very viscous sort of, uh, and, and 
coating and it makes a, a beautiful, beautiful satiny finish on the on the outside there. So that's what I used on that one. There's a whole bunch of uh, Sherwin Williams. Uh, there, everything is in flux now. Not only just hybrids and waters and oils, but companies are buying other companies. We got some Duck Back, we got some Super Deck, we got Sherwin Williams stuff, we got Arbor. It, everything is sort of mixing, and, and in five years, hopefully, this will all settle out and we get some stability um, and some consistency in the market. But uh, Sherwin Williams, I'm actually experimenting with log oils now for that hashtag cottage cabin project up north um, uh, of their two coat log oil system. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the three coat system. Think of the sick and sea tall system where it's a one coat of basically a penetrating or a coloring stain and then two coats of like a, think of it like a finish or a varnish, uh, a film forming finish. And that is a beautiful finish. And I've seen uh, cabins in Canada that can go 15 years without being recoated uh, when done correctly from the start. And it's, it's a beautiful system, but you're, you are finishing the house three times basically with a very, very expensive product right away. So you gotta have the right homeowner and the right expectations for that stuff. I always like to experiment with the two coat system. Uh, I found that you can get away with a little lesser finish, but maintain properly versus going with the huge Sickens Cadillac system, three coat system, and then just hoping it'll last for 20 years when it when it probably won't. So, uh, Todd, I hope that uh, hope that helps there. Um, I'm gonna run you guys down to my pressure washer quick while we're while we're doing this, and I'm just gonna quick show you my quick and dirty rig down here, and then we'll we'll call her a day. So basically, this is my little Mighty M. Um, I wash houses, I wash barns, I wash, you know, decks, uh, you know, you name it. I've, I've done insides of industrial plants, everything else with this guy here. Very, very simple. Uh, the way I get chemicals onto my decks when I have my choice is a, is a little uh, a soap siphon like this. So basically you attach this uh, to your pressure washer like that. That gets in the way of this guy. Normally you would just put your uh, high pressure hose right here. Uh, but on this one, you install uh, you install your soap siphon, and you have your jug of oxalic acid that you mixed up or sodium hydroxide, uh, and you stick this in there like that. And as the water comes through, uh, the, it pressurizes, it picks up some of whatever chemical you're putting in, and then goes here. This is called downstream. And then, you know, of course, you have your you know your nozzles and your uh, sprayer tips and things like that. There, so, uh, you use a special tip. Uh, soap tips like this. This is a nice wide fan pattern compared to, you know, uh, some sharper ones like that. Uh, and that'll basically just uh, get the chemical onto your deck very, very quickly, very, very effectively. Uh, and then, you know, when you go to wash or rinse, you basically just reverse that process like that and reinstall, reinstall that. Uh, so I don't have to shut down my pressure washer uh, to change out the hoses, I actually install the stop right here. So basically you can you can stop the water, release the pressure, change out the hose, the machine is still running the whole time. Turn that water back on and you're back at it again. So uh, that seems to be a very effective thing instead of shutting down the whole machine and doing that. So alright, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna scroll through these pictures here real quick. <coughs> this last week I posted uh, quite a few videos and pictures of me and the crew uh, not only restoring my house but also doing my deck so if you're interested uh, uh, chemically restoring decks things like that if you're interested about seeing me specifically do some of that stuff you can scroll through my Instagram feed my personal Facebook account there'll be a bunch of stuff there for you guys to go through so scroll through here and see who's watching Jamie thanks for watching Chad good friend Chad Bellino thank you for watching Thank you for sharing as well. Christine, <laughs> thank you so much from the PDCA. Uh, PDCA, it's great to see PDCA members connecting. I, I couldn't agree more. Danny, Danny and Brett, good friends of mine there. Thank you for watching. David Hammond, appreciate you watching the show today. Uh, Tim, uh, past apprentice of mine and one of the finest realtors in town, shared it. Thank you very much. Danny, what's up, Nick? Okay. Not a deck question, but I do have a product recommendation for good abrasion resistance for kitchen cabinets, preferably fast drying water cleanup. Do you have a product recommendation for good abrasion resistance for kitchen cabinets? Oh boy, uh, I know you've been doing quite a bit recently with uh, cabinets, Daddy. Uh, I am still a fan of uh, Advance uh, for my final coat on that stuff. There are a whole bunch of industrial products. I know that you've been uh, you've been dabbling with the uh, Sherwin Williams, I believe, water-based urethanes. 
or uh, water-based epoxies, things like that. Um, when put on correctly to the wet, uh, correct wet mill thickness, uh, I have really not found a better finish than either a pure oil enamel, like the Aperval, like the uh, Sherwin-Williams Pro Classic Oil, or the uh, Advanced Hybrid. They seem to be the most abrasion resistant if you give them time. And I, it's, it's sort of, <laughs> contractors love to poo-poo the drying times and the curing times and things like that, but, but honestly, we have to, doing a set of kitchen cabinets is insanely expensive. And most of mine that I do are more expensive than restoring the outsides of homes. So you have to consider what does this homeowner want? My goal is to get, get this finish to, to last 100 years. Now obviously it's not gonna look the same, but you want it to be serviceable for 100 years. I want people to get sick of the layout of the cabinets, the style of the doors, and their kitchen before they get sick of my finish. So uh, allowing a little bit extra drying time, a little extra curing time, it's not a big deal for me. You know, it's still a ton of work. So there seems to be a race to get a super hard product that dries super fast. I'm not sure that we can have both right now. There seems to be no free lunch in nature where you know you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's one of those sort of things where right now I don't know of a product that dries super fast that is super hard or any more uh, abrasion resistance than a traditional oil enamel fully cured or a, uh, a, a hybrid enamel fully cured. And I have not found a PhD chemist uh, to, to say anything otherwise. Uh, when I was doing my master's class in cabinet finishing, I pressed and pressed and pressed chemical engineers to just say, just tell me if a lacquer or a water-based finish will ever be more abrasion resistant or harder or more durable than an oil or a hybrid, and not one of them could say that. So not only is that borne out in practice uh, with what I found, but it, uh, also a chemical scientist uh, sort of backed that up as well. So again, Probably not a perfect answer, Danny. Uh, the, the, the most abrasion resistance are those ones I've listed there. I hope that helps out. Um, Aaron Halloran, thank you for watching. Angie Schneider, thank you for sharing. Uh, Christine O'Connell, thank you for sharing as well. Jamie Norris, thanks for watching. Richard Heilman, good friend of mine from up here, another fellow pro. Uh, Richard, if you're ever on the job, you have something interesting. Uh, send some pictures, or uh, we can always uh, do a site visit up there. We can do an Ask a Painter from one of your jobs. I know you do some really interesting stuff. I'd love to uh, love to see what your what your processes are. So let me know. Uh, Nathaniel, Jason, uh, mic is too low. I think we hopefully we fixed that one out. David Michael Olson, good friend of mine. Thank you for watching, sir. Chad Bellino, Hannah Brigaman, thanks for thank you for watching. Casey Palmer, thank you for watching. I do appreciate it. Christian Militello, good friend. Thank you, sir. Rafael D'Souza, uh, <laughs> great talking with you at the last expo. That was awesome. A Crossroads painting, uh, thank you for sharing the post. Anthony Cade, uh, I like watching your stuff on uh, social media, too. Uh, you got a beautiful backyard, by the way. Uh, Chad Bellino, how long do you tell a coating will last? Uh, hopefully, I gave that a pretty good, okay, good. There we go. Hopefully, I gave that a good answer. Don Taylor, thank you for watching. Calvin Pate, good friend Calvin Pate, thank you for watching, sir. Uh, Chad, thank you for sharing your experience, helps us all out. I hope so. Uh, you know, there, there's, uh, I, I hope that at least this is out there now and that if there's another young pro, like, a, you know, if I was, you know, by the time I started my business, I, I had the coding part down and the crafting part down, and not that there's not room for constant improvement, which I'm, which I'm doing, but let's say 15 years ago when I was still wondering about, hey, what about oil varnish? What about lacquer? Why does everybody use lacquer? Why do I see that varnish is doing better? I wish there was an archive. I wish there was something or somebody out there just explaining the basic stuff. This is before internet, but before social media. I just hope, if nothing else, this is just an archive for some young pro who wants to cut out on his own and, and do the right thing, look out for the homeowner, further the trade, uh, be an exemplary version of a craftsman. I hope that there's something uh, from this that somebody like that can take uh, without having to just randomly stumble upon somebody like that. So, Parker, <laughs> one of my apprentices, he must be having lunch, or at least I hope he's having lunch, he's watching. Uh, so, okay, well, thank you, everyone. I, I do appreciate this. Thank you for sticking out the long version today. I know it's there, but I want this to be a, a starting point, a jumping off point for pros and homeowners to interact about decks, questions we have. Let's keep this conversation going on here. Homeowners, pros, if you have any questions about this stuff, 
just keep them going here and we'll all get to them. This will be a nice little forum for everybody. And hopefully this can be a sort of landmark, uh, something that people can bounce off of when they have questions about anything about decks, the, the basics of it. So thanks again. Happy Friday, everybody. I'm going to get back to my crew. We're going to finish up a house today. We're going to make a clean break on a Friday. And there's nothing I like better than, uh, than, than doing that. So thank you all for watching, and we will see you next week.